Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. My assignment today concerns learning to see or look at or being able to behold the bigger picture. To behold the bigger picture, seeing the bigger picture, looking at the bigger picture. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans, the 15th chapter, the fourth verse, if you will read there, the Bible says that for whatsoever things were written, a four time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Whatsoever things were written a four time were written for our learning that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Very powerful scripture. And I pray that by God, I might be able to catch you and plug you into the spirit of what God is speaking concerning this portion of scripture. Let me take you back. So God needs a story to write. He needs a testimony to write. He needs a life observed and recorded about. He appoints scribes. He impresses it on the holy men of old to start writing. And everything that is happening has a source. The source is God's mind, God's plans, God's ideas, God's vision for the world. And so he creates certain people before you. He appoints prophets before us. He appoints judges before us. He appoints the patriarchs before us. He appoints kings. He appoints people in different dispensations and generations. And they have a lifetime. Experiences that are recorded about them and the things that happened. I mean, there are lessons, indelible lessons. There are principles there, patterns that are taught for us. There are deep instructions for us to follow. And God says, you know, after I have led all of these stories and put them together, let me make sure that these stories are documented. These stories are written because there is a woman and man who is going to come later. And in the years to come ahead, these things are going to be important for them, for their learning, that through patience and comfort of scriptures, they might have hope. But he would not have written if he did not have a story. And he could not write a story without men. And you see God weaving stories upon generations and generations. From periods and ages into periods and ages. Some failed. Some succeeded. Some died early. Some were killed before the end of their assignments. Some were killed, you know, before they even got to start life. Some died without fulfilling their assignments. You have stories upon stories in biblical history. But when you zoom out and start to understand the picture, there was a writing that you needed. And the only way God would make that story was by appointing lives and provoking destinies in the lives of people and defining their paths and ways they should go because at the end of the day, he needs a story. And that story is important for it to be written because when it is written, you will learn something. You will have patience and comfort of the scriptures that you might obtain hope. And the Bible has spoken to us about the purifications that come after hope. The Bible says that he which has this hope purifieth himself. 
the consecrations that come in the heart of a man or woman who has learned hope. I have preached a sermon on the God of hope. Look it up. It will bless you. So God has brought us to the end where everything is written and he needed a story to write. And he went into the lives of people and he ordained their destinies and commanded their going in and going out for that story to be revealed. What's the bigger picture? That right now you're being instructed by men's mistakes. You're being instructed by men's successes. You're being instructed in marriage by certain people's marriages in the Bible. You're being instructed to raise children by how certain people raise children in scripture. You're being instructed to do business by how certain people did business. You know what to do and what not to do by certain lives that were sacrificed for your sake that you might learn and obtain patience and comfort in the scriptures. Look at the bigger picture. That certain people's lives were put in danger because you needed to be instructed. Certain homes were broken because you needed to be instructed. I'm not saying that that was the intention of God, but it is so that now we can come in the, the integrity of his purpose, for which we cannot question why these things have happened. And we are where we are that he intended that it could be written. Have you thought for a moment that it was actually possible to have all of that history and it's not written? But it was written. Somebody shout hallelujah. It was written to instruct you, to teach you something. So if you come out of the small issue you found with David and the small mistakes Moses made, if God would help you for some second to zoom out and see from where he sees things, he's asking you, what was the lesson before you judge Moses? What was the lesson before you judge Abraham? You could have been Abraham. You could have been Moses. You could have been Rahab, a prostitute. But God puts you to the end where she is written of and her shame is bringing redemption and salvation for your soul. We will never understand why God loved us this way. But we're living in the best days of history because we have examples to learn from. Had a man known one day that the bigger picture would take us here, had the men who lived those lives known that the bigger picture would take us here, perhaps some would change their story. Perhaps some would adjust the narrative, but they were not able. They were not able. Because God in his infinite wisdom was working out something big. And that thing to the end is instructing you and I. So we thank God for every man and woman that has been able to teach us, whether in his mistakes or in his successes. Somebody shout hallelujah. A couple of years ago, I was flying to a certain nation to preach the gospel. And in my seat, I started a wonderful fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We started talking. And as the plane was taken off, as it had gone a few feet in the air, the Holy Spirit tells me, look down, what do you see? I was on a window seat. And I looked down and I said, I see cars. I see buildings, and I see plants. And I started to look further to see whether there was something that was telling me. But nothing in my own understanding could pick the detail of what he was telling me at that point. So I turned to him, and I said, what are you saying? He says, nothing. And I'm concerned that he's saying nothing, but I feel that he's trying to tell me something. So I hold my peace, and I'm, quiet. I say nothing. I'm waiting for him to speak. And then we go a couple more feet high. Then he asks me, what do you see? I look down again and I say, now I see cars and I see houses and I see the green. What's going on? He says nothing. And I keep waiting because I feel he's going to speak. I can tell when the Holy Spirit is going to speak. I can tell. I can tell when he's going to speak. So I wait again. And after some longer time, eventually he asks me, what do you see? And I told him, I don't see anything now. 
There were so many feet up in the sky that I could see nothing below me were clouds. I could see nothing. And then he said, do you know that in just a few minutes you have gone many feet high in the air and your physical eye is not able to see what a man is hacking another man for? What a man is killing another man for? Your eye cannot see that little 50 by 100 property that a man has killed his brother for. Those two acres of land that a man has killed his brother for. That five or six or ten acres of land that a man has had court issues for for over 20 years and they're not resolved. Now you cannot see it. Just a few minutes up in the sky. It seems as though it doesn't matter because your physical eye cannot behold anymore what is killing the sons of men on the ground. So he tells me, if in a few minutes I can change your perspective about life, where do you think the father dwells? How far is God from vision and from a vision perspective? I'm not about physical, you know. He's with us, he's in us. That's agreeable. But I'm saying from the perspective of his vision concerning mankind, how big is God compared to the earth? How big is God compared to that little property that these people are fighting for? How big is that God compared to the car that guy has gotten into to steal. How big is that God to the man who has a very big building and he is treating people the way he can and will because he feels that he's special and he's more blessed than the rest of them. Now you are at a point where it does not matter anymore because your physical eye cannot see them anymore. You can't even see the sons of men except those that you're sitting with in the flight. And that's when the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about seeing the bigger picture. I've already said this times out number, that space is full when you go into higher dimensions. One man sang that you turn your eyes on Jesus and look full in his glorious face and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Sometimes when you have the right vision about God, it's amazing how the biggest things can become so small until they are nothing. Here, the difference with the man on the ground was that I was seeing things from a higher place. So when the Bible says, come up thither, when the writer invites you to come up thither, be elevated in sight and vision and be able to see from the sight God sees the world. From the way God sees things, it's the only way you can observe the bigger picture. He says, come up thither and I will show thee things which must be after. It's only in the elevation of that height that you are able to see the distances. I could see many kilometers with my eye as I was going up in that flight because I was being elevated higher and higher and higher and higher. And as I was going higher, I could see spaces fold. And what was so far to see, the two-dimensional space now becomes so near to see because my altitude is elevated. There is a man who is diagnosed with a disease that is incurable to the eyes of men. And he will believe that he has to die, even though he's a believer, because he's seen from the dimension of fallen men. There's a young man or woman that has disqualified themselves in the things that God has placed in their inside for the world because they see things from the vision of a fallen man. They see things from the ground. They don't see things from high up there. Their vision is not elevated to see things from the perspective of God. How many relationships are breaking? Because people argue over minor things and then ignore the major how many people are dying because they're not able to see afar? The Bible scripts of Hagar 
and how she puts the lad, Ishmael Afadu, died because they are running out of water in the desert. And the scriptures tell us, and God opened her eyes to see the well which was ahead of her. Hagar would have died because she did not have the right vision. She was so near water, but her eyes were so blind that she would have died of thirst if the Lord had not opened her eyes. You see, you are working a job, but do you have the right vision of that job you're doing? You're running a business, but do you have the right vision of that business? You are running a ministry, but do you have the right vision of that ministry? Do you see from where God sees? Because God is the bigger picture. God is a bigger picture. Why would a man cut off the head or stab another man for a mobile phone? But just a few feet away you cannot see. Because their vision is small. Their vision is small. Somebody shout hallelujah. Their vision is small. Now the portion of scripture that I read for us in Romans 15 is an example of some of the portions of scriptures that God has spoken. And if you are a seeker and a reader of scripture, you'll find many other portions of scriptures wherewith God has spoken with a zoomed out opinion. With an eye that has zoomed out from looking at these miniature pictures to the bigger picture. Because God wants us to live. You will never live a matured life in God when you're not able to observe the bigger picture. That is why we forgive. That is why we let go. That is why we dream the way we dream. That is why we give the way we give. That is why we do all the things that we do because we have the bigger picture. When you're dealing with a child and they do things that are not right, there is a way you cannot deal with them because their children, their vision is so near. They cannot see the things that they must see. When you behold the bigger picture, you have the power to instruct and command destinies and generations. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody say it's mine in Jesus' name. In the book of Psalms, 139, if you will read from the 14th verse, I'll prefer the amplified version of this. This is the psalmist speaking about his birth from his mother's womb. He says, I'll confess and praise you. For you are fearful and wonderful for the awful wonder of my birth. He is reminiscing. He's looking through the experience of his birth. And he sees what a wonder God is and what a fearful God he is. He says, wonderful you are or are your works that my inner self knows right very well. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and intricately and curiously wrought, as if embroidered with various colors, and in the depths of the earth, a region of darkness and mystery. He says, your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book, all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape, when as yet there was none of them. The Bible says, how precious and weighty also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them all. Verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And he even wrote about it. Do you know? A book was written of your unformed substance. That's why God hates abortion. Somebody said, God help us. He says, in your book, all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape, even as yet there were none of them. God is a scribe. He is a writer. Somebody shout hallelujah. Again, whatsoever things were written. See, now I'm taking you somewhere. <laughs> because see, you're reading about Samson and Samuel. But there's all stuff that is written about you before you're formed in your substance. Oh, Rabba, Deleko. The only challenge is that not many of you have the ability to read it. Your eyes have not seen it. You don't have the vision of what was written about you in your most unformed substance. The Bible says the days of your life were written before they even took shape. 
as when there was yet none of them. So there is a story about you and what God has written. And there is also a report that Satan has written. See, he has written too. Satan has written too. So the Bible says, whose report shall we believe? Or when the prophet says, who shall believe our report? The children of God have a report written by God. We have something written of you. God has defined your destiny. And Satan also has written a report about you and defined his own opinion about your destiny. But here is the secret about this that is written of us. It's embedded in the spirit of revelation and it's best expressed in the mystery of his liberties. That God in writing about you, he did not say that I said you will go this far and this is how far you will go. There are liberties within which he has written about you. That only by faith can you understand that God writes in the liberation of mankind. God writes in vision of that spirit of liberty. That is why a man requires the grace to look into it. The Bible speaks of the law of liberty. He looks at looking into the law of free men. One version calls it the law of free men. We are going to be judged by the law of liberty. We're not going to be judged by anything else. We're going to be judged by the law of liberty. And it says, whosoever looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth looking therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, the Bible says that man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you have a vision? The right vision about your story? Because God has written our stories. And the spirit of revelation is the power of that interpretation. It's amazing how much is available for us who believe. It's amazing how much God has put our way for us who believe. You can fake anything, but you can never fake a relationship with God. You can worship and pretend you're worshiping. You can pray and pretend you're praying. But you can never fake a relationship with God. You can never fake the anointing. You can never fake revelation. You either have it or you don't. Are you hearing me? There's things you cannot fake. It's the same thing. There is a man who is plugged in the story of God, the dream of God concerning their lives. And there is a man who is not in that dream. Not that God has not dreamed for them, but they're not plugged in God's dream for them. Rather, some of them have gotten a wrong interpretation of life and they've defined their vision from the vision of fallen men. And so they think that that's God's will concerning their lives, but only because they're blind from God's vision concerning their lives. That's why I've preached to someone on God's dream for you. You see, the dreams you have and the dreams God has for you or of you. What does God dream about you? What is his plan for you? He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. That means he has planned for you. It's his plans to make you prosper. Thoughts of peace are not of evil. To give you unexpected end. Not your expectation, my expectation as God. So it's one thing for you to have an expectation that is contrary to God's expectation of you. And it's another when your expectation agrees with the expectation of God. It's so deep right here. I'm saying something so deep. What is your story? Why is it that in human history, even after the Bible, there are people they're writing about Luther, Martin, Reformation. They're writing about revivals in Topeka, Kansas. They're talking about William Seymour, Azusa Street Revivals. They're talking about revivals in different countries, different nations, and people that God used. Why is it that certain men are written about whatsoever things are written? Whatsoever things are written. Refuse to live a life that will not be written about. Can I say it again? Refuse to live a life that cannot be written or shall not be written about. 
if you were that kind of person that didn't even have it in your mind, I provoke you by God to believe God for something only he can do in you that it's enough for somebody one day to write something about your story. For he said, you are the head and not the tail. You are the head and not the tail. You are called to make headlines. Somebody shout hallelujah. He says, you're a city on a hill. What does that mean? You cannot be hid. You're the salt of the earth. That means without your savory, they cannot test. You're the light of the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. How can you not be seen in a world that is dark? God has called us, all of us who believe, to be great. To be great in this world. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so I'm provoking something. Today I came as a midwife. I want to call out something. God is going to do something in your life. I feel it. That God is shifting places for somebody in the name of Jesus. But that has always been the way of God. The Bible says in John the 18th chapter, the 37 verse, Jesus says, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. And everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. But the Jesus we're talking about was written about before he came. He shall grow up as a what? As a tender shoot. He's a prophet. He's speaking about the way of God. He shall come forth as a road out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. Isaiah sees the guy coming. God is writing something about the man who is to come. What I'm trying to say is, should God be generous to you enough to be able to understand what for your personal experience you could pick on whatever is written to see your story within the story? That is the place where you'll discover who you are. You can never know who you are until you find your story in the story. He says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. I come in the volume of the book. I come as one which is written of. My destiny is defined. I know what must be done. Somebody shout hallelujah. I know what must be done. And when John looks and sees from that bigger picture, he says, if the things that Jesus Christ did were to all be written about, if the volume of books was supposed to be collected together concerning the things that Jesus did, if they were supposed to be written about, the Bible says even the world could not contain or have room for the books that would be written if we were to go and search out what Jesus did. Do you know that some people, when they read that, they only think John is referring to what Jesus did only in the flesh? Do you know that you have a story in that portion of scripture? Ah, yere mare de boshika. You're a work of God. <laughs> you are a work of God. You just don't yet understand the power and volume and authority that you hold in the spirit. But you are a work of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. But I'm taking us somewhere. We're going somewhere. So we see that he is a God who is in the way of writing. Because why your life should be able to instruct a reader. When the Bible speaks of later, the end times, he speaks and says, he that readeth shall understand. Whosoever readeth shall understand. Reading what? Reading the word of God, yes. Reading the lives of men, yes. Reading history as God has ordained it, yes. But whosoever readeth, let him understand. Because this is another place. This is another place. This is a place for readers. I'm talking about readers. I'm not just talking about people who read the Bible only. Very important, by the way. Who read wonderful books of men of God? Very important, by the way. But how do you read signs? How do you read wonders? Do you know it's possible to read a miracle? Not of a miracle. I'm not talking about reading of a miracle. I'm talking about reading a miracle. That's the power of impartation. T.L. Osborne sits in the meeting of a man healing. He's come from India and his wife Daisy. 
and he is frustrated because there's a lot of sickness and as an evangelist he wants them healed he's preaching that Jesus is a healer and he cannot see healing he goes in a man's meeting and there's a girl with crossed eyes and this man looks at this girl and speaks a word and her crossed eyes become no more and the moment T.L. Osborne saw that he read the impartation took place and his own story he says he left that meeting knowing that he can heal the sick. He went to India and across the world. We were blessed to have him step on our land. And that man lived in an anointing of healing like not many people were blessed in these generations to see. Why? He could read. He could read. He could interpret. It's the power of interpretation and translation. Because without reading, you cannot understand. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? Huh? Remember the guy from Ethiopia? He's reading. The Bible says, but he understands not what he is reading. So he needs a man to help him interpret because salvation can only come to whatever is interpreted. Without the power of interpretation, there's no redemption or salvation. And that is why you should value revelation. The Bible says, I rejoice that your word is one which has found spoil. How do you respond to revelation? How do you respond to revelation? You find so much in the doors that God will open to you and the places you'll so easily access by God. Because some people treat as common what God regards not common. Why? Because it comes in a picture of a method or tradition that is familiar. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's not in methods. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. So to understand his person is a mystery. Because many are preaching a God who is misrepresented already. Many people don't have a clue about the true God. The Bible says that they have corrupted the vision of image of a God who should and cannot be corrupted and they've debased him into creeping things and flying things like birds and four-footed beasts because they don't have the understanding of his person and his glory what he is able to do in them and for them if they understood what he is up to do you know we suffer for nothing do you know people die for nothing? Do you know people are struggling across the world because they don't know the truth? For you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you understood that God ordained stories for your learning and the end of those testimonies, each one was that the scriptures might give you hope. What is hope? The expectation of good in the end. That's hope. The expectation of good. Beyond the desire, but the expectation of good in the end. He's trying to say that when you look through the scriptures and see what I have done in human history, you will see that you should expect good. Who has understood what I just said? You should expect good. You should have hope. You should have hope. That means nothing that is recorded in history, even with its rough ages and disadvantage, is not for your good. All things are working together for your good. Because you love him and you're called according to his purposes. Hope is a very powerful thing. It's a great power to have hope. But he's saying that this is why everything is written. That you might have hope. That you might expect good. Regardless of what you go through. And yes, there are people who went through hard times like you. And even worse than you have. But look through scripture and understand it from the way I see it. See the bigger picture. You'll see that the end was good for every man who believed me. The Bible says that those who believe in God shall not be put to shame. Nobody at the sound of my voice believes in God will be put to shame. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but one day it will turn. I said one day it will turn. And allow me to say that for some of you, it's turning this week. That's up to whoever is able to take it. 
For some of you, it's turning this month. That's up to whoever is able to take it. For some of you, it is turning this year, this season, in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Tell your neighbor, see the bigger picture. The Bible gives us a story of a gentleman called Joseph. He's a young dreamer. He has dreams that quite do not fit the order of human prediction. They frustrate the laws of inheritance. His father, mother, and brothers are worshipping him. They go against any law concerning how they have to grow. At least the father is even provoked. He tells him, are you saying that me, your mother, and your brothers are going to bow to you? You're younger. It's not the order of things. When God gives you a dream that is contrary to human order, it's a very dangerous thing to them because they're not able to interpret it. You see, if you understand God, that's how he works. You just haven't read what is written of you. You just haven't read. So let me help you interpret what you can easily interpret but by what you can read. This is a story of Joseph. You remember the story? He's loved by his father, isn't it? And the Bible tells us that he's sold into slavery. Goes to Potiphar's house as a prisoner because he's accused for trying to abuse Potiphar's wife. ETC, ETC. We know the story. And who knew that in all of this, God was knitting a story for you to have hope. So the Bible says that he was in fetters. He was held in chains. And the word of God proved him. But it is proving him for your learning that you might obtain hope. He's paying that price because somebody's going to come in and they don't need to go through all of those prisons. They just need to read. But if they should find themselves in prison, still, if they read it, they know what to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says Pharaoh dreams a dream. The famine that was going to hit the land. And he sees that there's no man with wisdom and spirit to be able to run the responsibility of stocking up food for Egypt. And later, feeding Egypt. And when famine hits, it hits the whole world. You see? And when it hits the whole world, the Bible tells us even the brothers of Joseph later come into Egypt looking for food. He's now governor of Egypt. And then we see later how they're fed. The family of Joseph has to leave wherever they were. And then they have to now come and live as royalty in Egypt. But God was needing something bigger than Joseph in prison could be able to interpret. God was needing something bigger than Joseph was able to interpret when the woman accuses him for trying to abuse her sexually. God was needing something bigger for Joseph, while his brothers were throwing him in a pit, he was meeting something bigger. He was weaving a bigger story. For some, they have the ability to see the bigger picture. But some are not able. And I don't think that Joseph knew what was going to come, except that he had a dream from God that one day, he would be the pillar of his father's household. But he did not know how it was going to weave out. That's why I say... When God gives you a vision, don't question the details because they will confuse you the more sometimes. He will tell you places you can pass and your normal vision and understanding would not be able even to interpret the possibility. Even when you know that with God all things are possible, God can do exceedingly abundantly that which you dare to ask or think. So some people, without the detail, they're not able to move. But let me tell you something. If he has said go, and you have the little ounce of dream, move. 
you will go through things that will make you question whether you are called of God. Some of you watching and listening have gone through things where you've asked yourself, but am I born again? Does God even care? Is his word true? You can ask all of those questions because Joseph could or might have asked himself those questions. It's not new. But in his infinite mercy, plus your questions, comes a man with a similar story or even worse than you're going through for your learning that you might obtain hope in the end. What a wonderful God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so the guy who is a prisoner, the guy who is a rapist, the guy who is rejected by his own brothers, God has built a vision on his life. And in the 49th chapter of Genesis, the 22nd verse, when Israel, Jacob, gathers all his children and he wants to speak into their destiny and the spirit of the Lord in him, he says, gather ye children of Jacob, gather that you might hear what your father Israel is saying. Israel was the one who spoke. Gather together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Genesis 49 verse 2. Hearken unto Israel your father. That's the spiritual man, not the physical Jacob. The man of the spirit was speaking and it's no accident that in the very scripture, God uses Jacob and Israel. See, so the man of the spirit inspired by the mind of God concerning Joseph. He speaks these words concerning Joseph's destiny. And he says, in the Amplified Version, Joseph is a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough by a well. Spring or fountain. Whose branches run over the wall. Which wall? That the grace and anointing on his life goes beyond the boundaries of our dwelling and our people. The anointing on Joseph was bigger than Israel. It could extend beyond the boundaries of their people. It could extend beyond the land of their people and his fathers. Look at God saying that the grace on this man goes beyond the walls of his country. But to take him out of his country, he goes in chains. To take him out of his country, he goes as a prisoner. He goes as a slave. He's bought like they're buying an animal off a store. But he's crossing borders. What people see, they're seeing a slave moving. But it's not a slave moving. Uh-uh. Destiny is calling of a man whose anointing is greater than that nation. Oh! What a God. What a God. And he allows you to read this story. To help you understand. Maybe you left your nation going to work somewhere in a foreign land. What vision do you have? Is your vision as small as that I left my motherland to go to another country so I would earn a living for my children? You have a problem already. Your vision should be that he made me cross these borders because the influence and glory on my life is bigger than what my nation could give me or what I could give to my nation. Regardless of how you went, whether you went on a boat, whether you went on a flight, whether you went economy class, whether you walked the journey, it's what it is. It's what it is. He's telling us that this guy is a fruitful well and these branches run over the wall. And verses 23, skilled archers have bitterly attacked and solely worried him. But you see, this is the problem. Skilled archers, the archers are skilled. God has even allowed the training of the archer to frustrate him. I wish the archer was not skilled, but the archer is skilled. That means they know how to frustrate you. They were trained in frustrating you. And God saw that training, but he saw the bigger picture. Somebody shout hallelujah. And he's saying that they attacked and sorely worried him and they have shot at him and persecuted him. Somebody shout hallelujah. But the Bible says, but his bow remained strong and steady and rested in the strength that does not fail him. For the arm of his hands were made strong and active by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob and by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. He says, verses 25, by the God of your father. Now this is him speaking. He says, by the God of your father who will help you and by the almighty who will bless you with the blessings of heavens above. Blessings lying 
lying in the deep beneath blessings of the breasts and blessings of the womb that is your children the blessings of your father on you he says are greater than the blessings of my forefathers Abraham Isaac on me and are as lasting as the bounties of eternal hills and they shall be on the head of Joseph on the crown of the head of him who was the consecrated one the one separated from his brethren the one who is prince among them he's above them all but he's a young boy he is younger than all of them they're mature but God speaking into the destiny of this man tells him that when I'm anointing you I don't anoint you in order of birth when I'm anointing you I don't consider your color when I'm anointing you I'm consecrating you I don't consider your education I don't consider your relationships I don't consider your networks I don't consider your tribes I don't consider whether you come from a first world nation or a third world nation whether you need to get a visa or you, whether your nation can't give a visa when I'm anointing you I don't look at what men look at look at the bigger picture so in consecration he is bought as a slave in consecration he is lied on in the house of Potiphar in consecration he is in prison but consecrated and separated some of you must understand that your consecrations and separations will not save you from the troubles of this world but surely you will be strengthened by the hand of the Almighty the God of your fathers. He tells him that the blessing that you have over your head is bigger than the blessing or greater than the blessings my father Isaac and grandfather Abraham could put on me. What is on you is fourth generational. It is bigger than all these men could have spoken over your life. But the man who had four generational anointings is the same man that was a slave. He's the same man that was in prison. It's the same man that they could accuse falsely and Potiphar's wife didn't even die. We thought she would die tomorrow morning because she said lies about the man of God. And I see somebody abandoning God because they can't parent. I see her abandoning God because it's been long since she got married and so she's able to get a non-believer. So he said, I'll settle with this one. I've believed him for so many years. You see a young man giving up to serve God because he served God for 10 years and he has no job and he's sleeping hungry. Do you have a clue? Do you have a clue? Do you even have the slightest clue of God's vision of what God wants to do and is able to do through you? Listen, your patriarchs served prison sentence but the Bible says he never doubted God because one day Pharaoh will dream come on tell your neighbor one day Pharaoh will dream a dream he cannot interpret this is prophetic one day Pharaoh will dream a dream I only can interpret something science won't interpret Something technology won't interpret. Something master's degrees and PhDs won't be able to interpret. And you'll be the interpreter. I said you'll be the interpreter. I said you will be the interpreter. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. And so, when the father dies in Genesis 50, the brothers think that he's going to avenge them. But at that point, when Joseph became governor, he had started to see the bigger picture. He knew what God was up to all along. It made sense. Famine was going to hit the world. And there was only one man who had enough wealth to store food. And the only way he could get this man to store the food to save the world was by consecrating and separating a certain man. But the bigger picture still continues. That one day, like later we see in scripture, the Jews will become richer, mightier, and more in number than the Egyptians. That's why they were taken into slavery. 
because they soon long lost the bigger vision. But one time after years evolved, we see that the children of Israel were multiplying and they were richer and greater than the men they found in that very land. Who ever knew that that blessing would come through a slave, a rapist? Whoever knew. So when Joseph's brethren, the Bible says in verses 15, Genesis 50, when they saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger to Joseph saying, Thy father did command before he died saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now the trespasses of your brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And the Bible says, Joseph wept when they spoke unto him. And his brethren, the Bible says, also wept and fell before his face. And they said, behold, we be your servants. It has come to pass. It has come to pass. All his elder brothers have bowed before him weeping. Verses 18. And they're saying, eat has come to pass according to whatever was spoken in this man's life as he dreamt. Now all of his brethren are under his feet saying, we are going to serve you. The Bible says he is the prince of them all. The crown is on his head. But he has the picture. And the next verse says, and Joseph said unto them, fear not for am I in the place of God? But as for you, he says, you thought evil against me. But the Bible says, but God meant it and too good to bring to pass, to bring to pass, <laughs> to bring to pass, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear you not, for I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Why? He had the bigger picture. Now, imagine a Joseph who is betrayed by his brothers, who is sold into slavery. And they expect that he will not forgive them after the death of their father. Imagine somebody in Joseph's stead. And the moment the father dies, he kills his brothers. Because he has unforgiveness. Who has understood it? Who has understood it? If God has trusted you with enough to save a nation, how can you lose the bigger picture and look to slay a man because you wronged him? That's why we forgive. Because we see the bigger picture. It's the thing Moses had not understood. That the position God has called you as Moses you cannot afford to smite what he has told you to speak to. Anybody in the lower level can rebel. You'll return back from the mountain and they've built golden images, molten images of Baal because they're rebellious by nature. And I will not smite any because I have you to correct them. But if you can go against my order, God told him seeing that you have not sanctified me, before the children of Israel, he tells him, you will not take them to the land I've given them. He disqualified a man's assignment because that man did not understand that with what is given to him, he cannot be easily offended. Do you know, as a man of God, I've seen people do things and I'm like, wow. This is a Joseph and they're killing their sister. This is a Ruth that refused to follow Naomi. This is a Philip that refused to serve Paul. This is an Elisha that went back to his father when the mantle was cast in. How much more can I say? That some of you, your destinies are already rearranged the wrong direction because you don't understand God's dream for your life. Look at Jesus. He's reviled and he reviles not back. Why? He has a vision. 
The Bible says he was beaten and abused, but he said nothing back to them. Why? He had a vision. Some of you is in take offense. Some of you, you're not faithful in the principles of God. God has ordained you to be the richest man in the world. And you're struggling to give a tenth. Yet, in the New Testament, you're even supposed to give more than that. Sometimes you're like, I wish you knew who you are. Tell your neighbor the bigger picture. Tell your neighbor the bigger picture. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12, the message version. As words of encouragement, he tells us that we don't see yet clearly the things that we must see as we should see them. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We will see it all then and we will see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But while we are going through that completeness right now, he says, until that completeness comes, we have three things that lead us the way. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is love. Somebody raise your voice and speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. Holy Spirit, we bless you. Thank you for your word. Help us, oh God. See the bigger picture. Some of you are losing sleep for nothing. It shall be well. It will all work out for good. It will all work out for good. Expect good. Have hope. Have hope. Have hope. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. I worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Because whoever is watching me and they're going through an incurable disease, I want to commit to you that the scriptures were written for you to know you will not die of that disease. The scriptures were written for you to know that your business will not fail. The scriptures were written for you to know that your ministry will not die. The scriptures were written for you to know that your marriage will not fail. The scriptures were written for you to know that your career will not sink. It might be in the dumps. You might be tested and you're without a solution or way out. But look to Jesus and leave. Zoom out from your little vision and see things from where God sees them. You will see that he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You will see that he has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You will see that the things that you are chasing and you're wasting time over because in the scheme of God's eternal purpose for your life, they hold no bearing. The opinions of men hold no bearing on you. Whether they love you or they don't, he says, I'll fulfill. Whether they accuse you like Potiphar's wife or not, he says, I'll fulfill. Whether they look at you as a slave or a nobody, he says, I still have plans for you. And I know exactly what I'm going to do in your life. Just allow me to do it by beholding the perfect law of liberty. Allow me to do it by expecting from me. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to just repeat these words after me. Just repeat these words after me. And say, Father, I thank you. Because you shed your blood for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. 
For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.